You know, John, a lot of folks like to say that prison isn't all that bad, it's not tough enough, it's not hard enough. In today's video, we're gonna get to see what someone will do to avoid going back. Hi everyone, welcome to today's badge cam lesson here at Active Self Protection. I'm your host, John Correa. And I'm your co-host, Mike Willover. Today's video comes to us from Fort Worth, Texas. Magtech is the only pistol or rifle ammo I use on the range and I recommend them highly. I've seen their manufacturing and quality control firsthand and it's incredible, which is why it always performs reliably and accurately. They are operating at max capacity and cranking out rounds for you to keep your skills sharp. Pick up some Magtech at your local ammo retailer or get it shipped fast at luckygunner.com. Officers have received a burglary alarm in the neighborhood. They see this guy, they're investigating. Let's listen in to the badge cams. We have multiple. Lighted. You don't got any weapons on you? No, sir. Look. It's raining tonight. Just keep it there. I will. Okay. You're in the military? It's been three years in the army. Thank you for your service. What, what do you do now? Construction. Construction. Why is the third car coming? Adam, three lightning shots fired. He's behind the target. Come here. Shot fired! Had to central! Stop! Running towards the 7-Eleven! He's armed, he's shooting that officer! Eventually this guy actually got away from the officers and you can see him here on a security camera from the area that is usually monitoring traffic at an exchange at an interchange. And he's gonna walk away like towards a different fast food restaurant at a freeway on ramp. And then he's going to actually trip over like a, 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 ear, like a grate of a, um, a storm drain. And then he just decides it's not worth it anymore and realizes what he's done, turns the gun on himself and dies by suicide. Thankfully, despite all of those bullets that went everywhere, 
No one else was harmed, neither an officer nor a private citizen. Whew, lots of bullets. Yeah. That's a lot of bullets. They're flying everywhere. I guess you can probably guess what one of our lessons is gonna be. You know, as this one begins, Mike, I think that, you know, people are like, why didn't they pat him down earlier? Why didn't they, you know, uh, get him in cuffs earlier? Because they just have kind of reasonable suspicion that crime might be afoot, but I don't think they have probable cause here that this guy is even involved. So they kind of like hold off and they're trying to slow play to see what the heck was going on here. Yeah, John, you know, when I worked task forces, uh, we did a lot of street enforcement of gangs and that sort of thing. One of the first questions we'd ask if we stopped someone who looked like could probably be a crook or a bad guy or, you know, considering a career in criminality, however you want to put it. Uh, the first question was always, hey, are you want prob probation or parole? Now, in most states, if the answer is yes uh, to probation or parole, usually most states, most of the time, you're able to detain somebody just with that information alone until you've conducted an investigation. So in this case, potentially, if they'd asked him that, uh, you know, they could have got him cuffed up, searched him, found the gun, and all would be right with the world. The problem with that, of course, is if he was going to run anyway, odds are if they asked him that question and started to approach him, you know, to cuff him for that reason, he still would have run away. But something to consider if you're an officer out there on the street, that could be your very first question anytime you suspect someone is a criminal and it could save you some time and some heartache. And I do think though, I mean, he tried here, tried to build a little rapport, right? Did you ever serve in the military? Yeah, I was in the army. Hey, thanks for your service, man. You know, I think that that was actually a really nice play to try to say, okay, if I can build a little rapport with this guy, see what's going on. Although we know, again, he's got a parole violation he's got to deal with here. He's got a gun on him. Is he a prohibited possessor? I'm not sure of. I know he had a couple of drug possession charges in previous times, so I'm not sure if those had risen to the felony level and made him a prohibited possessor. But now he's running. Okay, now we know something's going on. And then he pulls a big old gun. And you can see that right here. We've frozen it on the frame where you can see he has the gun. Officers, hear me. This is why eyes may be the windows to the soul, but the hands are the windows to the intent. So you wanna look somebody over, great. Don't miss the hands. The hands is where all the bad stuff is coming from. And, and of course, as soon as you see him with the, the gun in his hand, you know things have escalated significantly because if he just wanted to get away from it, he'd have just tossed the thing. But instead, he's running with it. Officers, you gotta, I, I think, assume that he means ill intent with that gun. Yeah, and we can, we can beat the Tennessee V. Garner to death all day long about, okay, at this point, we haven't determined that he's a permanent possessor, so he maybe, you know, is completely legally in possession of that gun. Look, the guy ran from the police, and now he's pulled a gun out. I mean, it, you know, it, it really is open for debate. But I think at this point, um, a, f a few commands for him to, to please, sir, drop the gun uh, and listen until he shoots at you. Um, you know, you have some soul searching to do to decide what do I do at this point? Because now I have someone who uh, was potentially a, a, a criminal doing criminal stuff. And now we've started to question him. He's run away and he's pulled a gun out. It's a tough situation to be in, John. Um, you know, I guess luckily enough for these officers, questionable, uh, you know, he did turn and shoot. So that kind of ended all doubt as to his intentions. His intentions were to either get away or you know, take a cop with him if he has to. Yeah, and so listen, big thing here, guy pulls a gun. I would assume he wants to use it. I would assume he knows how to use it. We've seen this so many times on the channel. Listen, if, if you want to get away from the gun, you can just drop it. And the fact that he holds the gun while he's running means he, he very likely intends to use it and therefore you need to take steps to protect yourself, including here, hey officer, you got to recognize, am I good enough to beat this guy in a gunfight? Am I confident enough in my gun skills to beat this guy in a gunfight? And if the answer to that is not absolutely 100% yes, then you need to work to do that. What we see here from this officer, very common, is that when the guy starts shooting at him, the officer stops and ducks. And, and that's normal human reaction. I don't want to give him too hard a time for that. But I think if you have the, the confidence that says, I'm way better at this than him, and I know that I can get him, and then the shots start coming, then your first answer isn't, oh no, I got to die. The first answer is, I'm going to win this fight. And that difference between kind of hunter and rabbit can be a very important emotional difference to, to help you win the fight. You said it, John, when you said that, look, the normal human reaction, that flinch reaction, you know, if you're if you're sitting home and your kid runs in from the next room and jumps in front of you and yells rah at the top of their lungs, you're going to flinch. You're going to startle. Startle reflex is natural. It's very hard to sort of train, you know, that out of you. However, give yourself permission. OK, I just, you know, I got startled by a gunshot. Now I'm going to get in this fight and I'm going to do things properly, which means in this case, which means standing tall, and delivering good, accurate fire. Um, you know, tell yourself this. You need to have this conversation with yourself before it happens. Can I do this? Can I stand tall in a gunfight and deliver good, accurate fire, even if I'm being shot back at? Because here's the thing. 
if that guy's good enough to shoot back at you and hit you, he's going to hit you whether or not you're shooting quickly or slowly. So you might as well shoot as fast as you can shoot effective, deliberate rounds and get rounds on target because misses don't end gunfights. And it doesn't matter how fast you're missing, it's still not going to end the gunfight. And I will say, I mean, all the hand switching here with the gun, I get it. He's trying to pick something off of his vest that's come apart. Not, not great. And also here, he is shooting quarter second splits at somebody who is... 25, 35, 40 yards away. He's across this building, across the street, into the parking lot of the next fast food joint. And and listen, I'm a really good shooter, okay? And I know really good shooters. And nobody is getting hits at quarter second splits at 40 yards, all right? Unless you're like, you know, a national champion level, grandmaster level USPSA shooter, which, okay, fine. Maybe there are 30 or 40 of those or 50 of those who could pull that off in the nation. Uh, your average patrol cop ain't it, right? So what you gotta really remember to do is you gotta remember grip is the master, sights set the pace, trigger is the servant, and you gotta train your soul that I can only shoot as fast as my eyes can see and as fast as my dot can stay on that target. And, and so it's my eyes, my sights, not my trigger that determines how fast I can shoot. And until we get there, we're panic firing, we're emotionally firing instead of trying to stop the threat. The next time, I'm talking to the officers and deputies now and agents, next time you're at the range by yourself or next time you're at the range doing a qualification course and you're doing that last course of fire that's whatever your furthest distance is, 15 yards, 25 yards, whatever it might be, take a moment and, you know, do run a scenario in your head. Okay, I'm, what am I doing right now? I'm shooting at a fleeing felon who just did X, fill in the blank with whatever crime he or she did, and now they're an active threat to the community. Tennessee versus Garner is in effect all day long, and now I need to deliver accurate fire. And go through that mental rep on the range when you have the chance. What, what am I going to do if this happens? I'm going to stand tall, and I'm going to deliver rounds as quickly as I possibly can deliver them effectively um, and make that something you do every time you go to the range. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I will say, I think these officers are bounding well, and they're communicating well. They're talking to each other, trying to figure out where did he go, what did he do, where did he go, what did he do. Really important stuff here. Now, I also want to say, man, you got to be cautious when you're working on teams like this because look what happens. This officer then draws up, and he fires a shot at, at just the right side of those two buildings where there are two officers just to the left. If he low left pushes that shot at all, it's a blue on blue. It's fratricide here. And so please, officers and, and private citizens as well. I mean, if you got a partner, right? You got a spouse or a bestie that, that you hang out with all the time and you guys are, are working in tandems, priority of fire is a thing. And you got to recognize I'm not in a position to fire here because I can't do so guaranteeing the safety of those around me. That's very difficult to do, but you have to do it. Yeah, once this was all over, uh, if I was one of those two officers we're seeing here in this freeze grab on the left, uh, myself and this officer would have a very long and unpleasant talk about priority of fire. Um, not okay. Uh, the, the reason being is, I don't care how good of a shot you are, you can't control what the other officer is going to do at any moment. They could decide, okay, I need to I need to get to my right very quickly, and the next thing you know, now you do have a blue and blue, you don't want that. So, you know, you have to be able to trust the people who are sort of on point or in front of you to do the job you want them to do, you need them to do, and not take shots like this. I mean, maybe if he were way off to the right-hand side, I could see it, but he wasn't. And another thing, to all the people getting ready who've clicked and their cursor is now blinking in the comments section about this sort of thing, look, John and I know that some of, the, some of these videos frequently, you know, the backstop is a problem, and the backstop is a big problem because there it could be people back there and officers are sort of firing seemingly blindly. And so, yeah, we see it too. It's just that every video, we can't get to every single training point in every single video, otherwise they'd be an hour long and you wouldn't watch them. And listen, sometimes we do those. If, uh, again, those of us in the Aspen Limited app, we do deep dives, we do first watches, those kinds of things. Here on YouTube, you know, uh, we don't do that all that frequently when we're on the YouTube channel because, again, folks just don't end up watching that kind of content and it ends up being too much. Second officer shows up, okay, fine. He goes for the taser, I get it, if he doesn't see what's in the guy's hands. But the thing that I love here is the second he realizes what he's facing is a deadly threat, he literally just drops the taser. We do not see people drop tasers very often on the channel. In fact, I really can't think of a whole lot of times where we do see it. And so I just wanna take a minute and applaud this officer. He did the right thing here, which is this taser is now a liability in my hand. I need a gun in my hand. I don't need to futz around with trying to holster it. I need to get my gun in my hand. So he drops that taser and goes to the gun. 
And I think he deserves kudos for that. Behind the scenes, John and I frequently joke about um, when we see stuff like this, hey, maybe people are watching the channel and getting the idea. Now, we don't claim we don't claim any credit for this officer doing what he did as far as dropping the taser goes, but it is very gratifying to see. This is exactly what we're talking about when we mean empty your hands, get rid of it. I almost want to criticize him for even throwing it forwards a little bit. Just empty your hands. I mean, when I say that, I mean just open them and let go of whatever's in there on your way to getting your gun, which he did a fantastic job here. And yeah, this is what we mean we say empty your hands get them cleared and get your gun out um a lot of we've seen i think one time we saw a guy with a flashlight a taser and a gun in both of his hands all at the same time so this guy's got the right idea yeah now listen fires a bunch of panic rounds there right bang 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 then he's gonna come back here wait a minute i can't do a great job of that so he's gonna stand tall deliver a single round and and listen that was a good emotional kind of check-in moment right I see that pretty frequently in law enforcement encounters. Obviously, we don't get to see this in private citizen encounters very much because they're not wearing badge cams. It's surveillance footage, and it's a little different. But, but recognize here on the badge cam, you saw him hit five, six rounds, bang, 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 bang. And then as he chases a little bit more, wait a minute, that guy's a long way away. And then he slows up, gets a good shooting position, and puts at least one round downrange with some real care. That shows really good heart, although it's gonna kinda go away in a minute here. I think that's what we wanna see. Stand tall, settle your sights at farther distances, and make it happen. It's tough for me to see here exactly where the suspect is in relation to the officer, but this is the second time when it looks, just from my perspective, I could be wrong, I'm not seeing what the officer sees, but it's the second time in this video where I've seen really good cover available and not being not being used. Um, I would like to have seen him get a little bit more to the left. It looks like a telephone pole to me, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, telephone pole will definitely stop pretty much any handgun round I've ever heard of. So uh, consider your cover when you're doing this sort of thing. Uh, understand what can and can't stop a bullet. Understand on a car, for example, what parts of the car will and won't stop a bullet and avail yourself of that wherever possible. All right, now he is gonna then, once again, go back to panic firing here. Bang, 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 super fast. Now watch this really, really good reload, right? So gun comes down, magazine goes out, new magazine goes directly in without any hesitation, slide comes down, gun's back in the fight. Fantastic reload technique, really well done. But why is he reloading his gun? He's reloading his gun because he's had two instances where he has ripped a whole bunch of rounds down range. So the number one cause of reloading is missing and misses don't end gunfights. I do think cops, by the nature of their mission, need to learn reload technique and need to be very proficient at reload. So kudos to this officer for being very good on his reload. But but I want to really reiterate that he shouldn't be out of rounds because he shouldn't have put that many rounds down range at this point. 100%. Yeah, the quick the quick and dirty reload um, drill on the range is just to, to have a gun in the holster with one round of the chamber with an empty magazine, draw, fire, have another magazine ready and, and practice your reload. Do that over and over and over again. And I think it's something that's critically important for law enforcement. We don't see it so much with private citizens. John has, has watched one 11 billion uh, gunfights uh, on video. And, and I think he's never maybe once ever seen a civilian use a reload, never once. He's, he's nodding at me. Um, however, in this case, look, as an officer, you need to learn how to reload quickly. But Yes, I am saying you need to slow your roll. And again, I don't ever want to say shoot slowly, but what I mean is slow your roll, stand tall, see your sights, see your red dot, see whatever it is, and get a good, well-aimed, deliberate shot on target. Because one deliberate, well-aimed shot takes about as long as 15 panic rounds. Yeah, again, it's not about being slow. It's about being careful, right? So be careful. Use as much care as you need. Now, I do think the officers, again, did a really good job communicating between each other, not, not charging up the radio as many times as they possibly could, but talking to each other. Where'd he go? He went this way, went around that side, come with me over this way, whatever. And, and I think that that was a really good job. And I also want to point out here, this is just chaos. This guy's fleeing from us, shooting at us. I don't even know what the heck the original problem was, but now I got a guy who is clearly a fleeing felon. He's shooting at cops. Uh, and I need to stop him right now. And that chaos is a number one thing. And, and, and making sense of that chaos and doing what you need to, I, I think that's a skill that our officers really excel at. Yeah, I've, I've been in pretty chaotic situations before, John. I was a first responder to an active shooter. This was years ago, back in 2008 or so. Um, but it, it is your job as a law enforcement officer to maintain that professional demeanor and that calm. I'm not saying these guys didn't. But if you're an officer, if you're a deputy, man, calm is a superpower and it's something that you just have to exude. You have to be the one in charge. I don't mean like tough guy in charge. I mean the one in charge of a scene and be able to 
keep your demeanor in such a way that you know that, that you're keeping other people calm now at the end here john i think you wanted to talk about this really quick but uh this guy trips and ends up deciding to take his life yeah and, and i hate this you know uh suicide is obviously a big thing in my world and suicide prevention so listen, you know, you ever get to that place, please make sure you get the help you, that you need. We're going to put the links in the description there and you can even text and get help. Uh, obviously, this guy's got big problems and the officer that, that came across him and came and took him into custody had to deal with all that and the officers all had to deal with all this. And I know some people in the comments are going to say, oh, that guy was a dirtbag and so, you know, good riddance to bad rubbish. But, you know, I do think human life is valuable and I think that this is terrible that he made these decisions and he put himself in a place where he felt like nothing was worth living for anymore and this was the better choice. Suicide is a terrible answer. I understand, though, that, you know, it's a real problem in our world. And so I, I don't glorify it and I'm not glad that this guy died by suicide. I hope you're not either. My hope is, is that we get to a place in our world where we get folks the help that they need. They don't end up in a kind of place where they're suicide and that they don't put themselves in that place by deciding to run from the cops over a parole violation because it's just not worth it, friends. I think these officers, man, I, I don't want to give them too hard a time. I think that given a tough situation, they did the very, very best they could. I'm glad they all went home at the end of the day.